Good morning, everybody. My name is Pap Sam again, and uh, my real name is Alvin Bandra Sam, but I like to be called Pap. It's easier and shorter. <laughs> I hope you had a good breakfast, and the trip to Valencia wasn't really bad for you. So I was asked to discuss linking entrepreneurship and education. I think I'm going to start with the wonderful presentation of Ignacio, I got it right, about what will education look like in the next 30 years. But I want to add another question as well. Why do we educate? Is it for the money? Because based on this presentation, we talked about a lot earning. If you have a bachelor degree, you'll make twice as much as somebody who didn't. If you have a master degree, you will make this amount. Are we educating for the money? Or are we educating for the knowledge? Or are we educating for both? Or are we educating to change the world like what we said? I'm sure those are questions that you will digest and you will think about. But let me ask you also another question. Why some of the world richest people are college dropout? Why? You see Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, Ted Turner, Michael Dell, so on, so on. In every country you go, in each one of your countries, you have somebody who didn't finish school and ended up being one of the most successful people. Successful meaning money. So why is that? You might ask yourself, why is that? So, what and why do we educate? If you look at the average earning of billionaire dropout, which is 9.4 billion, approximately three times as much as a billionaire with a PhD. Why is that? Somebody who went to school has a PhD, and somebody who didn't finish school ended up making three times more than somebody who went to school. So it goes back to the question, why do we educate, and where education will be in the next three years. For me, based on my understanding, there is several factors that kind of limit the formal education that we have right now. Because we have what we call the teacher-student education, which means that there is one-way relationship in transferring knowledge. The students believe that the teacher knows everything. And with this 21st century, where you can Google anything, I was asking somebody at breakfast, how did you find out about this conference? He said, Google told me. <laughs> so if you have Google telling people a lot of things, what is the role of the professor or the teacher in the classroom? So that's something I think that's one of the factors that's a little bit limiting when it comes to education. So education in a formal setting is a little bit limiting. And that's why today I want to talk about how to link education and entrepreneurship. It does not mean that education is not bad. Most of those people that I mentioned earlier, the billionaire, the successful people, they had some kind of education. It's either high school, elementary, but they had some kind of education. That really means that education is good. It's good. But the question we are, we're not asking is why do we educate? Why do I go to school myself? Is education for me? Is education for you? Is education for all of us? Is education timely for me or not? If you look at what we've been dealing for the past three to four years, 
the economic recession, where most young people, highly educated, couldn't find a job. You look at the Arab Spring, you look at the young Africans risking their life, crossing the sea to come to Europe. You look at high unemployment in Europe, in the US. You look at people fighting against Wall Street, sitting there. All is about employment. It's all about finding a job. It's about changing the world. But if you cannot do it, if you don't have the resources to do it, if you don't have the means to do it, if you don't have the knowledge to do it, it becomes a problem. So what we really need to do, or what I believe we need to do, is to link education and entrepreneurship. The question becomes, how do we do that? How do we link education and entrepreneurship? Since both are good, but they're not enough. Just using one of them is not enough. It's not a matter of which one is better than the others. There's a lot of people discussing, oh, should I just forget about going to school and trying to find a job? Others are saying, should I just go to school, uh, find a job and forget about going to school? For me, that's the wrong debate. The debate is how do you bring the two? Because there is nothing in this world that one single solution can fix. It requires synergy, it requires sustainability, it requires success stories to inspire people. So how do we link education and entrepreneurship? So entrepreneurship, unlike education, is about creating values, creating shared values for yourself and for others. I repeat, it's about creating value, creating shared values for yourself and others. And what is value? Every one of us here needs something. Every one of us here has something to offer. So it's a matter of finding the things that I need. It's a matter of finding the things that I can offer. And how do I link those th things? How can I identify what you need and provide you what you need through what I have or somebody else that I can link you? That's what's entrepreneurship. How can I identify your need Identify somebody else's need or offer and create a synergy where one need will address the others. That's what we call entrepreneurship. And all those people, the successful people, they were able to create that. Because at some point, they realized that within the classroom, within school, what we all call thinking outside of the box, there was not that culture of letting me think outside of the box. And they were already thinking about outside the box, so they needed to find a place, they needed to find somewhere they can create that and develop that relationship. But entrepreneurship as well is not easy to do. It's not for everybody. It's not something you just get up and figure out and find and do. It has a process. Many schools right now have entrepreneurship programs, they have innovation programs, but they still base everything on what I call expert intuition. I'm the expert, I developed this, I know it, you should do it, you should learn it, you should know it. That does not work, because everything is a context based. Everything is based on your own reality, your own context, like what Ignacio was saying earlier, your own culture, your own assumptions, your own beliefs and expectations. And as a human being, part of a bigger society, we should test what we're saying, we should test what we believe, we should suspend our assumptions. So entrepreneurship should be based on what I call entrepreneurship innovation-based experimental learning. Entrepreneurship, innovation-based experimental learning. And the key here, 
that I want you to focus is experimental learning. Because experimental learning means you try, you fail, you learn, you get up, you try again, and you succeed. Every failure is a learning if you document it. But in a culture where failure is not tolerated, you don't learn much. And that's what happened within our schools and universities. When you get a big F, you don't want to go home, you don't want to share it. And tell me, these people that you know right now called successful, which one of them didn't fail? You mentioned it, they all fail at some point, but they learn from that to be able to develop something successful. I'm not encouraging fail, uh, failure, but I'm saying encouraging experimental. So how do we do that? I'm going to share with you a couple of things that I have done through my work at different places. First, with the entrepreneurship innovation-based experimental learning. People ask me to come to them or to their organization and say, Pap, we want you to work with you, we want to help. And I said, no, I cannot help. Because you know your problem better than I do. But I can use an approach that we can work together. And that approach is that's what I call the experimental learning. And this is how it works. In every country, in every organization, every institution, there is always what I would call the knowledge gap. What is a knowledge gap? Some people say need assessment. Some people say organizational analysis. But the knowledge gap is, what are the things that we need within this community, within this country, within these institutions, that we don't have the skill or the knowledge to address? What are the skills and the knowledge that we have within this community, within this organization, that we're not leveraging? So that's the first step, the knowledge gap. The things that you have that you're not leveraging because you don't know you have them, the things that you don't have and need them and need to get them. Once you identify the knowledge gap, then you start providing training to address those knowledge gaps. You develop training to get those skills that you need. You develop training to get those skills that you have but haven't been leveraged because you, don't know, you didn't know them. And then you support that with coaching, with mentoring. That's one piece also we're missing within our educational, formal educational system, the mentoring, the coaching. That's something we're missing. So that's the second step. The third step for the experimental learning is that once you identify the knowledge gap, you already provided training to address those knowledge gaps. What is it for? What are the skills for? You don't just get skills to have skills. We just don't go to school to just get skills to have skills. No. We don't go to school to just to learn just because we want to learn. We have them because we want to do something. And that's what goes back to what I was talking about earlier, creating this value for yourself and others. How do you create values for yourself and others? That's the third step. What can I do for my neighbors? They need, they will be willing to pay a price for. What do I have that I can share with others in terms of skills that they will be willing to pay a price for? Because we all have something to offer. And we should stop throwing away people because we believe that these people can, or they don't have the skills, they're not competent. In India, there is, just to give you an example, an organization during the recession. It's called the GN Irrigation. I met with the founder who started the organization 50 years ago when he was 35. 
And he started by selling pineapples and bananas and all those things on the street. And then grow a multi-billion dollar company. Now they're in 114 countries. So I told him, asked him, what is your secret? He said, I don't fire people. And I said, wow, what if they're not doing what they're supposed to do? He said, everybody has something to offer. It's just a matter of finding what they're passionate about, the purpose they have in life, and helping them support them to do that work. And that was, during the recession in India, the only company that made profit. That's amazing. So this is to tell you how to link entrepreneurship and education. Another thing I'll sort to give you a real example is there is another program or approach in terms of training and linking education and entrepreneurship called the Social Entrepreneurship Venture Creation. It's a six-step approach that really take anybody who wants to do business from idea to sustainability or community building. We tend to ask people to give, develop business plans. Go write a business plan. Go do the research. Go give me the number. If it's a big business, by the time you finish it, the data might no longer be relevant. We're living in the world of big data. Meaning, in terms of business, you have to know what your customer wants before they do. This might sound crazy to you. How can I know what my customers want before themselves they do? I'm selling you something, but I need to know what you want yourself before yourself you do know that. So that's the concept that we base the social entrepreneurship venture creation. Meaning, in a world of big data, all of you, every time you open your laptop, your computers, and all those things, sometimes you just see something pop up, and you're asking yourself, oh, I was thinking about this. It's because you try to find it, and they're tracking you. Everything is tracked. So they know exactly your interests, so they will just push it to you, to your eyes. And you see it, you buy it. That's what all this Google stuff. But the venture creation, the social entrepreneurship venture creation process is that you have six steps. Everything is based, again, on customer feedback. So the first step is what do we call idea to pilot. You have an idea to do your business, we'll take, ask you, take this idea, go outside. Don't write anything. Go outside. I want to sell a bottle of water in my community. Go outside, ask people. Will you buy a bottle of water? How much will you buy it? Why, why not? Are you buying it right now? From who? How much? So you're testing that. So you're not just putting everything based on assumption. You're testing that. And that's a way of developing a business plan. So from the idea to pilot, the pilot to proof of concept, that's the second step, which is once you collect all those ideas, you start to have a proof of concept, which means that pretty much equivalent to the action plan that you, we're talking about. The proof of concept to investment ready, that's the third step. And that's where I mentioned earlier that sometimes you can Try to know what your customer wants before they do. And there is a no concept also of leveraging money through your cl client. You don't have to get a loan from a bank, but you can ask your client, your potential client and buyers to invest in you by giving you half of the price of the, something they might want to buy from you because they believe in you. And you already associated to them from the process, uh, in the process. So from investment ready to revenue generation, that's the fourth step. From revenue generation to share value creation. That's the fifth step. And to share value creation to building community. 
And what do I mean by these six steps is that if you look at the first three steps, it's all about going outside, testing, and including people that might be your client. The second three steps is all about creating more value for those clients, helping them build their communities, because the more revenue they have, the more they will spend. The more revenue they have, the better their family will look like. The more revenue they have, the better the community will look like. So that will be more sustainable, because anything you develop in life, in a few years or months, somebody else will develop it. But you have a relationship with your client by caring about their community, by giving back to their community, not making them, putting them at the end of the business model, but the beginning of the business model, you have a competitive advantage. So this is how we create and link uh, entrepreneurship and education. The last example that I want to give you in terms of connecting or linking entrepreneurship and education is another program that I recently developed with a university, American university, called the Global Share Value Leadership Program. And what does it mean, that program? I graduated from the executive leadership program at AU. And after graduation, I told myself, wow, I learned a lot of nice concepts. But in the practical world, what am I going to do with this? Really, to change the world, like he said. And there is, in this world, three main industries, business, nonprofit, and government. Of course, there is social entrepreneurs that we call you know, the fourth industry. But it's just a gap, the feeling. So these three main industries have to work together in order to address community needs. So what the Global Share Valley Leadership Program does is that it takes eight people from a nonprofit or a community-based organization and ask them to identify a real, real, real problem within their community. And once the problem is identified, you ask a business or a local business within that community to provide or develop a product or service that address that need. For example, let's say drinking water is missing within a community. That's a problem that was identified by a nonprofit. You ask the business to create a product or a service that cleans that water to make it drinking water. So now they created a product or service to address the problem, but the community will buy it. So they will generate revenue for themselves but at the same time, they're supporting the local community. So that relationship between nonprofit and business will educate government to develop new policies to support that. So that's how the global share value is built. So you take eight leaders from a nonprofit, eight leaders from a uh, business, eight leaders from the government, have them work together for two weeks where it's based on action learning, not theoretical learning. It's action learning. You go test it, address it, and fix it. And that's how they will work for two weeks, address the problem, and solve it. So that's how I see that education. In order for us to change the world, in order for us to generate values and revenues for ourselves, we have to be able to build education in our uh, entrepreneurship in our educational system, based it on experimental learning where you test it. It's not expert intuition but also make sure we create values that solve our problems as human beings and community. Thank you.